The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and thanks for joining our webinar on the IEA's 2018 Energy Efficiency Market Report. We're just going to wait a few more minutes um, to see if a few more people join, so um, please hang tight and we'll be with you in a moment. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining our webinar on the IEA's 2018 Energy Efficiency Market Report. We're very pleased to see so much interest in today's webinar, which is being organized by the IEA in cooperation with the Brazilian Energy Research Office and the Ministry of Mines and Energy, and with CENER, the Mexican Ministry of Energy. Thank you for your ongoing support. My name is Edith Bayer, and I'll be moderating the webinar. I'm joined by my colleague, Joe Ricci, who's an energy analyst in the Energy Efficiency Division at IEA and was the lead coordinator on the report. Here's the agenda for today. In a moment, I'll say a few words about the webinar platform. This will be followed by some welcome remarks. Um, there's a small change here, so the welcome remarks will come from Carlos Pires, who is Director of Energy Development at the Ministry of Mines and Energy. Um, and we'll also hear welcome remarks from Santiago Creueras, Director General for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at CENER. Following the introduction, Joe will give the presentation, followed by some time for questions and answers. We very much want you to participate in the webinar, and we encourage you to post comments and questions in the comments box throughout the webinar. Uh, this slide shows you a snapshot of the attendee interface you should be seeing on your computer. There are two ways to connect to the audio of the webinar. One is through your computer's audio system, and the other is if you'd like to call in by phone or if you're having problems with the sound on your computer, you can click on telephone in the audio pane, which will display the telephone number for your country. We also included the numbers here for Brazil and Mexico. Uh, so just call that number, and by clicking on telephone, you'll avoid feedback between your phone and computer audio. 
Please enter questions in English, Spanish, or Portuguese in the questions pane as they come to you, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. Please also note that we're recording the webinar, and we'll make a link available for those who have missed it, along with a link to the PowerPoint presentations. And finally, following the webinar, you'll receive a short survey estimated to take two minutes. Some of you have done this before. We're revising these surveys every time we send them out to get new feedback on the presentation and on priority topics, so we appreciate your continuing ideas. Um, and lastly, we've sent around translations just before this webinar in Spanish and Portuguese of the slides. We hope that this is helpful to you. If you haven't seen the translations, please check your inbox. Um, we've sent them to people who registered um, up to a few hours before the webinar. Um, so now I'd like to invite um, Carlos Pires to give a brief introduction. Carlos, the floor is yours. Hi everybody. First of all, uh, I, did, I would like to say that uh, the sound quality is not good enough to, to understand everything you say. Uh, well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm Carlos Alexandre. I'm the director of the Energy Development Department here in, at the Ministry of Mines and Energy in Brazil. And well, I, I would like to thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. And I understand this is a great opportunity to see the highlights of the IEA Energy Efficiency Market Report 2018. Well, uh, here in Brazil, we, we have a lot of expectations regarding energy efficiency as we are committed to the Paris Agreement with targets of uh, a decrease of 10% in energy consumption by 2030, considering a baseline of our long-term plan. And in, as you they all know we are in the middle of a transition after our elections here in Brazil. But the tendency is to keep on doing things like we've been doing. Uh, and well, we hope all the, the energy efficiency programs will be continued, uh, even improved in the forthcoming years. So once again, I do appreciate your participation and wish you a fruitful meeting for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, Carlos for, the, for the kind words. So now I'd like to, hopefully you can hear me, um, Santiago. So I'd like to give the floor to Santiago Creueras uh, for a few words from Center's side. So I'm sorry, we seem to have a problem connecting Santiago. So Santiago, I'm very sorry. I'll, we'll see if we can sort it out and, and um, maybe you can make some closing remarks towards the end of the webinar. So now I'd like to give Joe Ricci the floor. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edith. Uh, bon The work of the uh, International Energy Agency on Energy Efficiency. Uh, my name is Joe Ritchie. I work as a policy analyst in the Energy Efficiency Division. Uh, and I'm going to be talking through some of the key findings from our Energy Efficiency 2018 publication. This is the sixth in our market report series, looking at global trends and indicators for energy efficiency. Uh, on your screen now, you can see uh, the report uh, and the various components of the report. Uh, we first of all have a look at global trends and outlooks, and that includes our examination of energy intensity and energy efficiency trends. We also introduce our efficient world scenario, which I'll be talking about uh, during the presentation today. That's a special focus and feature of this year's report. We also look at trends and progress relating to energy efficiency policy and also present an efficient world strategy. 
Now the IEA's efficient world strategy is essentially the policies and measures that we see as being needed in order to unlock the massive potential that energy efficiency can deliver to the global energy system into the future. Uh, we also have chapters where we focus on energy efficiency in the transport buildings and industry sectors. We also look at energy efficiency investment, finance and business models. And this year we have a special focus chapter where we look at energy efficiency in emerging economies. These six economies, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Mexico and South Africa, are all part of the IA's Energy Efficiency in Emerging Economies program and we have a deep dive on energy efficiency trends and outlooks in these countries. The great part about this report is that it's freely available to download from the IEA website. You can go to iea.org forward slash efficiency 2018 and download the report for free. And obviously, hopefully some of you will have done that. If you haven't, uh, please do so uh, if you find the content to be of interest. So now I'm going to go through some of the highlights of the publication this year. I'm going to start with looking at some energy efficiency trends and outlooks. As part of this, we're going to not only look at global trends and outlooks, but we're also going to have a look at some of the trends in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, and that will obviously provide an insight into some trends of energy efficiency in the two countries that have obviously been the focus of today's webinar. So the first key indicator or metric that I want to highlight is the change in global primary energy demand. So as you can see here, in every year of this decade, global primary energy demand has increased. In 2011 and 2012, primary energy demand increased by about 1.5%. In 2013 and 2014, it increased by slightly less. And in 2015 and 2016, global primary energy demand increased by about 0.5%. So we've seen growth slow over the course of this decade. But in 2017, we saw a much different trend. Global energy demand rose by nearly 2% in 2017. This was the fastest rise this decade, and as I'll talk about in a few slides time, was driven by economic growth and also some changes in consumer behavior. The other key global indicator that we track uh, as part of our energy efficiency analysis is the annual change in global primary energy intensity. So this is the amount of primary energy demand per unit of global GDP. And we obviously want to see this metric going lower each year, which indicates that the world is becoming less energy intensive. So again, this decade, we can see that global primary energy intensity has actually been uh, improving at a reasonably fast rate. In 2015 and 2016, it improved by about 2.5%. But in 2017, we saw a much different trend again and that is that global primary energy intensity improved by only 1.7%. That was the slowest rate this decade, and it would have actually been worse had it not been for the influence of China. With the lines that are coming up on your screen now, you see global primary energy intensity without China. What we can see here is that improvements in primary energy intensity in China have been very important for the global trends. In fact, had it not been for improvements in China in 2017, global primary energy intensity would have only improved by about 1.2%. So China has very much become an engine of global progress on energy efficiency and improvements in energy intensity. Now I mentioned at the first slide that global primary energy demand has risen in 2017. But there are factors that are contributing to this, and there are quite a number, but to get an understanding of those trends and the impacts that they have had, we at the IEA undertake the decomposition analysis. And in decomposition analysis, we analyze all the factors that put upwards pressure on energy use, 
but also put downward pressure on energy use. And that gives us an understanding about what impacts uh, these factors are having on energy use. So here we have decomposed final energy use in some of the world's major economies. These include all IEA member countries, which as of December last year includes Mexico, plus China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Russia, South Africa and Argentina. So here we have at the moment an a representation of energy use in 2000 for these countries. But since 2000, we have seen more, buildings, more building floor space added to the global building stock and people purchasing more energy consuming appliances. And those factors put upwards pressure on energy use. What we are also seeing is some less efficient transport patterns. Now, these transport patterns are things like people moving from using public transport to driving their own cars or uh, buying more or less energy efficient cars like moving from hatchbacks or sedans towards SUVs or other larger, less efficient vehicles. And that also puts upward pressure on energy use. The other big factor, which you see on your screen now, is increased activity. Increases in activity across all sectors of the global economy, links, of course, to economic growth, have really put upward pressure on global energy use. This has been the predominant factor that is driving a rise in global energy demand. But of course, there are other factors that put downward pressure on energy use. The first of those are shifts in economic activity. And what I mean by this is the movement of economic activity away from energy intensive sectors like iron and steel manufacturing or cement production towards less energy intensive sectors like food, beverage or textile manufacturing and also the service sectors. That puts downward pressure on energy use and also and importantly we are seeing improvements in energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is improving but as you can see here from this decomposition analysis its impact is being overwhelmed by other factors that create more demand for energy. But just how big is the impact of energy efficiency? Well, you can see here on this graph, the green line is global GDP. And in the graph on the left, we see trends for global energy use, which has increased by about 40% since 2000, and trends for global emissions, which have also increased by about 40% since 2000. Of note for emissions is actually a flattening in emissions in recent years. But in 2017, you can see that emissions actually went up by about 2%. And that is also linked to that increase in energy use, which are highlighted in the very first slide. So these are the actual trends, but what would they have been without energy efficiency? Well, as you can see here, without energy efficiency, both global energy use and global emissions would have been 12% higher in 2017. In terms of energy use, this would have been like adding another European Union to the global energy system. And in terms of emissions, this would have been like, uh, this would have been effectively 4 billion tonnes of additional greenhouse gas emissions. And we would not have seen that flattening in emissions that we have uh, in the recent past. So energy efficiency is having a very big impact. But what sectors are making the most substantial gains on energy efficiency? Well, on this slide here, we see what sectors are contributing to these efficiency gains. And for both the major economies and also for the major emerging economies that are the focus of the IEA's Energy Efficiency in Emerging Economies program, it is the industry sector that has been a key contributor. Uh, China has been very important for this. The size of its industry sector and also its improvements have led to substantial energy efficiency gains. When we look at the other sectors, we see that buildings and transport are making contributions, but buildings is uh, much larger than, tra in, uh, than transport. And the reason why transport is small is because of the variable nature of fuel economy standards for things like cars and also trucks, as well as some of the changes in consumer behavior uh, in particular, people moving away from public transport 
towards personal vehicles and also people buying larger, less efficient personal vehicles as well. So now what we're going to do is look at some of the energy efficiency trends in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, and we're going to start with Brazil and we present here a decomposition of energy use in Brazil between 2000 and 2017. So first of all, what we see here is that in Brazil, there has been a lot of activity growth. So activity across all sectors of the Brazilian economy is putting upwards pressure on energy use. There has been some structural change in that economic activity is shifting towards less energy intensive sectors. And there has also been some energy efficiency gains. In fact, improvements in energy efficiency in Brazil avoided 5% more energy use in 2017. And when we look at where these energy efficiency gains are coming from, similar to the global trends that we highlighted in the previous slide, it is the industry and service sectors that are driving a large number of efficiency gains, uh, as, a, as is the passenger transport sector. But obviously, these gains haven't been enough to fully offset this strong activity growth that we are continuing to see in Brazil. When we look at Mexico, we again see strong activity growth putting upwards pressure on energy use something obviously that is expected considering the emerging nature of the Mexican economy. But we don't see the same level of structural change. And that is because in Mexico, we are seeing other changes such as the increasing amount of building floor space and appliance ownership, and also those transport patterns that are changing that puts upward pressure on energy use and offsets the negative impacts on energy use that are associated with shifts in economic activity. But again, we are seeing improvements in energy efficiency, not enough to entirely offset the activity gains, but that has prevented 3% more energy use in 2017. When we look at where these savings are coming from, it's somewhat different to Brazil in that it's residential buildings and passenger transport that have seen the most uh, energy efficiency gains since 2000. And this is linked in many ways to uh, Mexico's uh, appliance standards and also fuel economy standards for passenger cars. So what I've talked about so far has been all current and historic trends. But as I mentioned at the very start of today's presentation, in this year's report, we have an, a special efficient world scenario. And this efficient world scenario was developed to get an understanding about what a more efficient world might look like. So one of the things that we know at the IEA is that the world is missing opportunities to improve energy efficiency. Current policy is not delivering the full potential gains that are available with energy efficient technology that is at our hands today. So what we wanted to do is understand what would be possible with greater efforts on energy efficiency. And to do this, we worked with our colleagues within the World Energy Outlook to develop a new efficient world scenario that answers the question, what would happen by 2040 if countries realized all the economically viable energy efficiency potential that is available today? So just pausing on this, sen this sentence here for a minute, Economically viable means that all of the energy efficiency measures that we look at between now and 2040 are cost effective. They all pay back within the life of the measure. And by available today, what we mean is that all of the technology that we consider is currently available. So the scenario is in many ways realistic and presents a positive picture as to what could be possible with increased efforts on energy efficiency. And we look at the benefits of energy efficiency for the global economy, the global energy system, and importantly, the global environment. Focusing at a very global level, we have here a simplified representation of global GDP and global energy demand at current, le at current levels. Uh, in the efficient world scenario in 2040, global GDP would be double what it is today. So we would see a lot more prosperity, a lot more people lifted out of poverty, and obviously a lot of other benefits associated 
with a doubling in the size of the global é, economy. Eu já resolvi fazer umas sondagens iniciais aí para fechar as ideias, vou realmente me candidatar. But in terms of energy demand, what we would actually see is energy demand not increasing by only a marginal amount. And as a result, we could see energy productivity more than double. That is, we could actually produce twice as much GDP for every unit of energy that we consume. A very big benefit and a large increase and improvement in global energy intensity. To focus on that in a bit more detail, here is the here on this graph we can see we can see energy intensity for the world and also for the six major emerging economies that we work with here at the IEA. And what we can see from the dark blue and the light blue lines is that global energy that energy intensity in these countries has actually improved since 2000, although it is to varying extents. In the efficient world scenario, as a result of increased efforts on energy efficiency, energy intensity both globally and in all these economies would decline much more substantially. And in fact, across all six economies, energy intensity could fall by over 50%. So energy efficiency could provide very substantial productivity benefits. And when we look at where the potential efficiency gains would come from in the efficient world scenario, one of the things that we recognize in the report is that governments have implemented policies or currently implemented policies that are intended to realize some of the energy efficiency potential that currently exists. Likewise, they have also announced policies that are intended to drive further gains in energy efficiency. This scenario is what we at the IEA refer to as the new policy scenario. It captures effectively a future in which, in which governments maintain what they are currently doing and what they have said they are going to do, but nothing else. And in this new policy scenario, or NPS, some of the energy efficiency potential is unlocked. But as you can see here, the vast majority of energy efficiency potential is not realized in this scenario. And in the efficient world scenario, we see energy efficiency potential realized to a much greater extent. What you should also note from this slide is that the, the sector with the largest potential for energy efficiency savings is, is transport. And that's actually opposite to the historic trends that we highlighted in our previous slide, which showed that transport had been the smallest contributor to energy efficiency gains. And I'll talk a bit more detail about some of the trends and opportunities in transport, but obviously it's important to note that we effectively see a reversal of historic trends about where the future potential could lie. Now, obviously an important benefit and one that uh, is going to guide a lot of efforts into the future will be in relation to emissions. So here on this slide, we see historic greenhouse gas emissions to present. And then these, this light blue line here is global emissions if governments maintain current policies and implemented currently announced policies. So effectively, if they didn't make any major changes or didn't really push energy efficiency harder than they currently are. And what you can see here is that emissions would actually rise. We would not uh, have a scenario or a future in which we would be able to realize the targets of the Paris Agreement. But if we look at the emissions in our efficient world scenario, we see a much different trend. Increasing efforts on energy efficiency would actually result in an early emissions peak. They would fall by 12% compared to current levels in 2040. And this would contribute around 40% of the abatement that will be required for the world to be in line with its Paris targets. And therefore, we conclude, and hopefully other people on the webinar today would agree, that energy efficiency is indispensable to achieving global climate targets. Other pollutants are also reduced in the efficient world scenario. In particular, emissions of particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, and sulfur dioxide fall by about a third in 2040 compared to levels in 2015 through our increased efforts 
on energy efficiency. And this obviously has a lot of benefits in relation to human health uh, and also living standards in many countries. So now we're going to look at the outlook for energy efficiency in Brazil and Mexico uh, through our uh, new policy scenario and efficient world scenario. So again, we start here on Brazil and we can see that without any additional policy efforts on energy efficiency, that energy use in Brazil would continue to rise into the future. But with additional efforts on efficiency as described by the efficient world scenario, energy use would still rise, but it would be contained and Brazil would actually save or avoid an additional two exajoules of energy use in 2040. In terms of the sectors where these savings would come from, we see here that it is the transport sector and the industry sector that would contribute the vast majority of potential energy efficiency gains in Brazil. When we look at emissions, we can see that without any additional action on energy efficiency, that emissions in Brazil would rise, but in the efficient world scenario, emissions would stay at virtually the same level as they are at present. Again, a big benefit there from an environmental perspective from energy efficiency in Brazil. When we look at Mexico, we again see a very, very similar trend in relation to energy use. Without any additional action on energy efficiency, uh, energy use in Mexico would continue to rise. But with our efficient world scenario, we could see a case where Mexican energy use would follow a much different trend. In fact, it would nearly peak by 2040 and Mexico could actually avoid one exajoule of additional final energy use in 2040. In terms of the sectors where these savings are achieved, uh, again, we see a substantial contribution from the transport sector, plus also contributions from buildings and industry. When we look at emissions in Mexico, uh, we again see that without any actions on additional action on energy efficiency, that similar to Brazil, emissions would rise. But in the efficient world scenario, emissions could actually fall to levels that would be nearly 8% less than they are at present. Now, this is obviously all in the context of Mexico continuing to enjoy the benefits of strong economic growth. So emissions could actually fall, but, economic, but the Mexican economy could continue to grow, all as a result of cost-effective energy efficiency measures. So I highlight there the benefits uh, of energy efficiency into the future for the global energy system and also uh, emissions, but there are benefits across all levels of the economy that are derived as a result of increased efforts on energy efficiency. One of the key benefits is in relation to avoided imports of fossil fuels, particularly coal, oil and gas. In major importing regions, particularly the EU, China and India, they avoid about US $700 billion worth of additional uh, expenditure on energy imports. Similarly, the industry sector avoids about US $600 billion in additional energy expenditure in 2040 as a result of increasing their efforts on energy efficiency. And when we go right down to individual households, well, globally, households also avoid over $500 billion in additional spending on energy. And this, again, is all linked to these energy efficiency measures, which are cost effective and use currently available technology. So now what I'm going to do is look at the key drivers of energy efficiency trends, both currently and into the future. And that is, of course, energy efficiency policy and energy efficiency investment. So, what we do at the IEA is we look at uh, energy efficiency policy and in particular we do a lot of analysis of mandatory energy efficiency policy. And by mandatory energy efficiency policy, I refer here to things like minimum energy performance standards uh, for things like refrigerators or electric motors or other consumer appliances and equipment. We refer here to building energy codes. We also refer to fuel economy standards for trucks and cars. 
and also any mandatory energy efficiency improvement targets uh, that are actually applied uh, to industrial companies or to industrial sectors. And to first of all get an understanding about how widespread these policies are, we estimate the amount of global energy use that is actually subject or covered by a mandatory energy efficiency policy. And when we look at this on a sectoral level, we can see that across all sectors of the global economy, that the majority of energy use is not subject to any mandatory energy efficiency policies. Globally, about 34% of global energy use is covered by some sort of mandatory energy efficiency policy. Uh, and it varies across other sectors. But again, in no sector is more than 50% of global energy use covered by a mandatory energy efficiency policy. We can also look here at some of the trends for Mexico and Brazil. So we start with Mexico and we can see that in the industry and transport sectors, uh, policy coverage in Mexico is less than the global average. But in residential buildings and non-residential buildings, the presence of appliance standards and also building codes sees coverage in Mexico exceed the uh, global total. Uh, but for Brazil, the story is a little bit different, uh, particularly in transport, where the lack of fuel economy standards for cars and trucks sees uh, policy coverage be much lower than the global average. Uh, and in all sectors, uh, policy coverage is less than the global average. So obviously, scope there uh, for uh, consideration of additional mandatory energy efficiency policies into the future. But policy coverage is just the first part of the policy story that we look at in Energy Efficiency 2018. We also need to consider the strength of mandatory energy efficiency policies, as this is an important indicator of what impact these policies could potentially have. And by policy strength, I refer here to the performance standard that appliances must meet in order to be sold into a national market or the target that is actually applied to companies or industries to improve energy efficiency or the stringency of building codes. And so what we do also through in Energy Efficiency 2018 is look at the changes in policy strength since 2000. So in this graph here, you can see the percentage change uh, since 2000 in mandatory policy strength. Uh, you can see in the early part of the 2000s that policy strength increased at a fairly slow rate. But in 2006, very large economies, in particular China, started to introduce mandatory energy efficiency policies. And this bumped up uh, in policy strength quite considerably. And in the first part of this decade, we saw similar growth in policy strength as countries like China continued to expand mandatory energy efficiency policies, but other large emerging economies like India also started to introduce mandatory policies. But in the last two years, we've seen a concerning trend, and that is that policy strength has uh, basically increased at a slower rate than the preceding years. And this is a result of countries uh, I suppose lessening the rate at which they are implementing new energy efficiency policies or uh, lessening the rate at which they are strengthening existing energy efficiency policies. So this indicates that there may be a slowdown in global energy efficiency policy implementation. And at the IEA, we also combine policy coverage and policy strength to a single indicator, which we refer to as our Efficiency Policy Progress Index, or EPI. And the EPI charts the, in the, well, the change in policy coverage and policy strength since 2000. And combined, it gives us a picture of the progress on global energy efficiency policy. So on this graph here, we can see policy progress in each year since 2000. So again, in the early part of the 2000s, we saw somewhat slow growth. But then after 2006, when China started to implement its policies, 
policy progress stepped up uh, quite markedly and it has progressed steadily since that point uh, and obviously increasing since then. But in 2016 and 2017, we obviously saw, as I showed in the previous slide, a slowing down in the strength of new or existing policies and that, as a result, has led to policy progress slowing. So whilst energy efficiency policy is progressing, it is doing so at a slower rate than it has done historically. And this slowdown in energy efficiency policy progress is another factor that is uh, also contributing to the rise in global energy demand and the slowdown in global energy intensity improvement. So now the other key factor and driver that I mentioned was energy efficiency investment. So in our market report, we analyze and estimate the investment in global energy efficiency. And what we can see here is that energy efficiency investment has been increasing. And in 2017, it also increased by about 3% to US $236 billion. Europe is the major market for energy efficiency investment. Uh, but overall, what we see here is that whilst energy efficiency investment grew, it did so at a slower rate. So that's again similar to some of the trends like energy intensity that we saw and highlighted earlier in the presentation. In terms of the sectors where this investment is going, the global building sector represented by this dark blue line on the outer ring here represents nearly 60% of total energy efficiency investment globally. Transport is about a quarter and industry about 15%. But the building sector continues to dominate because of, its, uh, because of the ability for low cost, easily implemented projects to be invested in. And obviously that's current investment, but how much will we need to invest to realize the efficient world scenario? Well, here we see on this graph current investment levels, but to realize the efficient world scenario, investment actually needs to increase. It needs to, annual energy efficiency investment needs to double between now and 2025, and then double again to 2040. And it will be important for policy to facilitate this increased investment. And we need to see finance and business model innovation in order to increase levels of investment. So now what I'm going to do is quickly touch on some of the trends in the transport, buildings and industry sector. Uh, and I'll start with transport. And on this graph here, you can see the historical trends in terms of annual energy efficiency improvement across the various components of the transport sector. Uh, passenger light duty vehicles, you know, passenger cars and road freight trucks have actually seen fairly low rates of annual energy efficiency improvement. That is in, that is in comparison to aviation, so planes and also ships that have seen much stronger improvements in energy efficiency. But that's the historic trend. What could be possible in the efficient world scenario? Well, energy efficiency could actually improve by a much faster rate. In particular, passenger car fuel efficiency improvement could increase a lot as a result of, of uh, traditional cars becoming more fuel efficient and importantly, people adopting more electric vehicles. In terms of road freight trucks, again, we could see strong growth of energy efficiency improvement as a result of the fuel efficiency of trucks also increasing. A key driver of this will of course be uh, policy and in this slide here we analyse the coverage of mandatory energy efficiency policies within the transport sector. We do this by country because what you can see here is that transport policy and transport policy coverage is very variable. In countries like the US, China, Germany, France, Japan and Canada, where policies have been in place for an extended period or they exist both for cars and trucks, coverage can be quite high. But in other countries 
like Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa or India, coverage is much lower because standards either don't currently exist or they've only recently been introduced. And fuel economy standards are quite important. If on this graph here we see uh, a bit of analysis about what would happen with and without uh, fuel economy standards within the transport sector. So if the world hadn't had any fuel economy standards between 2000 and 2017, we would be using about an additional million barrels of oil equivalent per day within the transport sector. Likewise, if we had actually made more efforts on transport energy efficiency policy, so in this case, if all countries had implemented best in class fuel economy standards, we would actually be saving 2.2 million barrels of oil a day. So not only have standards been important to, where, to get to where we are, but there's still more efforts we can do to unlock savings. And to demonstrate this, if the world implemented no new energy efficiency policies within the transport sector between now and 2040, we would actually see transport energy demand rise by about 4 million barrels of oil a day. But in the EWS, as a result of increased efforts on transport fuel efficiency, we actually see that fall by about 4, billion, 4 million barrels of oil a day. So fuel economy standards will be very important. Finally now, we turn for, in the transport sector, we look at our efficient world strategy for transport. And so in this strategy, we highlight what is possible in the transport sector as a result of increased efforts on energy efficiency and what policies would be needed to realise this potential. So first of all, what is possible? Well, in the transport sector, energy demand could stay flat between now and 2040, despite doubling activity levels. And we could actually see a large amount of savings from passenger cars and trucks as a result of improvements in fuel efficiency and electrification of transport fleets. And in terms of the policy actions that we see as being needed to realise these, these gains, we actually highlight the fact that we need to improve the coverage and strength of transport policies, not only for cars and trucks, but also for other transport modes. And in addition, we also need to see people incentivised to support the uptake of more efficient vehicles and also improve the information and uh, data that is available to support consumers to actually uh, adopt more efficient vehicles and also shift towards more efficient modes of transport. So now we're going to move to the building sector and we start with a similar graph that we had for transport which shows here that in the very, across the various end uses of the building sector, that energy intensity improvement has been variable. We can see that space heating has shown strong growth, as has water heating, but in other areas, space cooling and appliances, we see some variable growth, mainly because of increased appliance ownership. But in the efficient world scenario, these trends are much different. Across all building end uses, energy intensity could actually improve. And when we look at where the gains would come from, we actually see that space heating, water heating, and space cooling would represent about 60% of the total efficiency gains in the building sector. In terms of policy, again, we analyze here the amount of, policy, amount of energy use that is covered by mandatory energy efficiency policies by building end use. What we see here is that for some end uses, in particular for lighting and space cooling, that policy coverage is actually quite high. For lighting, that represents the fact that you know, lights are fairly easy to regulate and there's a, there's a large turnover. For space cooling, it's because a lot of countries that have growing demand for space cooling have some form of standards. Across the building sector as a whole, and in other end uses, policy coverage is around 40%. So the majority of buildings uh, end use remains not covered by mandatory energy efficiency policy. Now, I mentioned space cooling, and that has been an important focus for the IEA this year. In a previous webinar, we talked about our future of cooling report. 
that looked at historical trends for space cooling and also what that might mean for the future of the, of the uh, building's energy demand. What we do in our report, again, is we look at historical trends for space cooling energy demand. And we can see here that since 2000, space cooling energy demand has risen strongly as a result of fairly uh, large activity growth. Now, without any additional actions on energy efficiency, activity would continue to rise. And this would obviously be a very large impost on buildings' energy use. But in the efficient world scenario, the average air conditioner in 2040 could be twice as efficient as it is today. And as a result, we could see fairly substantial efficiency gains that would offset a large percentage of this activity growth. It wouldn't offset it entirely and energy demand would still rise but energy efficiency would limit the impact. So just to highlight some of the uh, uh, observations and the uh, key five, the uh, components of our efficient role strategy for buildings. So between now and 2040, building floor space could increase by 60%, but we would have no additional energy use. Space heating, cooling and water heating, as I said, offer a large percentage of the savings. And in terms of some of the policy actions, well, again, we highlight that the need for comprehensive efficiency policies that target both new and existing buildings and also minimum energy performance standards for appliances, they need to be strengthened and expanded. Incentives are needed to encourage consumers to adopt more efficient appliances and undertake retrofits on their buildings. And we also, again, need to improve the quality and availability of information in relation to building energy performance. Now, the final uh, sector we want to highlight is the industry sector. I'll do this quite quickly so that we have enough time for a bit of Q&A. So again, here you can see the energy efficiency improvement across the uh, subsectors of industry since 2000. Uh, of note here is cement that has seen very strong energy efficiency improvements and that is because we've seen a large amount of very efficient new production capacity built in places like India and China. So we also now, uh, when we look into the future in our efficient world scenario, we see that energy efficiency can continue to improve across all sectors of industry. Within the iron and steel sector, energy efficiency could improve quite a bit as a result of uh, increased metals recycling, and that's something that's very important for Brazil. But we also highlight a very strong improvement in energy efficiency within these other industries, and that includes sectors like food and beverage manufacturing, uh, textile manufacturing, electronics manufacturing. They are actually responsible for about 70% of the total energy savings in the industry sector, uh, and they are. Um, and the, and the key technologies there are things like electric motor driven systems, improving the efficiency there, uh, and also deploying electric heat pumps for process heating. That is also an important driver of energy savings. Looking at policy within the global industry sector, and this graph here shows changes in the amount of industrial energy use covered by mandatory energy efficiency policies since uh, 2000. We saw some fairly slow growth in the early part of this century. But then in 2006, China introduced its top 1000 program. And this put mandatory energy efficiency improvement targets on large industry. This increased policy coverage substantially. And in 2011, China expanded this program to cover its top 10,000 energy consuming companies. And as a result, policy coverage grew strongly again but still, we are seeing that policy coverage in the industry sector is around 38, 37%, but that is still less than obviously uh, uh, the total, uh, well, uh, the, not, not the majority, and therefore there's, there's opportunities for additional policy coverage to uh, occur within the industry sector. Um, that's, this slide here shows again uh, China being the driver of global industrial energy efficiency policy coverage. Japan and India are also quite strong uh, as a result of 
mandatory policies that place targets on companies. And in these other countries, this policy coverage is a result of electric motor standards, which are present in both Brazil and Mexico. I'll go. I'll skip over the other slides. Obviously, you've got the handout. You've got the uh, the translated version. So apologies, we weren't able to get to those. We do want to have time for Q and A, but I'll just uh, focus here quickly on uh, energy efficiency in the industry sector and our efficient world strategy. What is possible within industry by 2040? Well, evaluated per unit of energy could double between now and 2040, uh, and less intensive industry sectors could actually provide 70% of potential efficiency gains in the industry sector. But what do we need to achieve this? Well, we first of all need to see expanded and strengthened standards for key industrial equipment, such as electric heat pumps and motors. We also need to see incentives to encourage companies to adopt energy management systems. Though energy management systems like ISO 50001 are very important to actually drive gains across entire industrial processes and systems. And we also see an important role for mechanisms such as industry networks, training and case studies to enhance industry awareness and capacity to deliver efficiency gains. So that's the final slide from the industry sector. I have a couple of concluding remarks, but I won't go through those in detail. I'll leave those on the screen for those who want to read them, but we can now look at a bit of Q&A. Yeah, so, so maybe we can start with a sort of a, a, a broad question, which is um, whether the global recession was part of the IEA calculation on energy demand or rather how, how that was factored into the calculation. So, so in terms of the global recession, you can actually, in terms of um, historically, and I apologise, I'm going to actually, uh, I might have time to go back, I'm not sure, but you can actually see that um, when we look at the trends historically, that energy efficiency, energy use and uh, emissions actually dipped during the global recession in 2009. So we do take that into uh, consideration um, as far as our historical trends go. So what you can see here is obviously the dip around 2009 that represented uh, the global financial crisis or the global recession as it's called in, in various parts. As we look to the future, um, the efficient world scenario doesn't explicitly take into consideration uh, any global recessions or any other financial crises. It uh, uses obviously projections that assume uh, steady and, and uh, consistent economic growth. Uh, but obviously if that were to happen, then you know, we would potentially see trends like we saw in 2009. Uh, another question here about why emissions went flat uh, during this period here. Well, one of, the, one of the major drivers of that has actually been improvements in energy intensity, which meant that while global GDP continued to rise, uh, uh, global energy use grew at a much slower rate. And also we saw, of course, rises in renewable energy and these increasing renewable energy uh, did offset, in many cases, additional uh, energy demand. So as energy demand grew, a larger share of that new energy demand was met by renewable energy. So energy efficiency kept demand increases low and renewable energy was used to meet new demand. Uh, another question we have is uh, whether or not we can say that the countries that have uh, changed more than others is because of uh, their own efforts or because of uh, a requirement of government. So if it's individuals or if it's governments. I think it's probably, the, the answer to that one is probably that individual choices in many cases are being influenced by government policy. So when somebody goes out to buy a new appliance, be it a new refrigerator, a new television, they are buying in many cases the most efficient version of that because the government has introduced the policy that requires those appliances to meet certain uh, performance standards before they can be sold onto the market, or they might have labels or performance labels that allows them to make an individual choice. So it's uh, very much, it's very much um, a situation of individual choice being driven or influenced by government policy. Uh, another question here about freight transport. So why, uh, which are, okay, what, so the freight transport energy efficiency strategies 
um, and what are we seeing as being viable. So for freight transport, one of the key emerging policy trends that we have witnessed in recent years has been the introduction of fuel economy standards for trucks. So at the moment, uh, China, Japan, Canada, the United States and India have introduced fuel economy standards for trucks, similar to how they have done it uh, for passenger vehicles. Uh, but uh, obviously, in, there's other countries which you consider similar standards. Uh, the European Union is considering introducing such standards, so that will also be important. Another factor as well that could obviously enable gains within the transport industry will be improved logistics. So this will be things like trucks uh, traveling less time without being completely empty uh, or improving the route in which they travel so that they obviously can travel the shortest distance as well. Those sort of things will be aided by improved data collection on uh, transport activity uh, and that is being aided of course as a result of the digitalization of the energy system, something that at the IEA we touch on in a report which looks at uh, digitalization in the energy system and we also look at that a little bit in this year's report as well, but it's also an ongoing focus for us too. Thank you, Joe. And I, I'm reminded now by, by the Eiffel Tower that sparkles on the hour, <laughs> which is right outside the window that, that we've, we've reached time. Um, unfortunately, because we've, we've had quite a few questions come in at the last minute, um, including from, from some of our colleagues over at EPE. So we, we do read all of these questions afterwards and take them into account and we'll, we'll engage with some of you on these questions outside of the, the webinar. So thank you for sending those. Um, uh, I also learned that Santiago Creueras from Cener unfortunately had to leave so, so we won't get any closing remarks from him. But I'd like to thank again Cener for their support and, and MME and EPE for their support in organizing this webinar. Um, and as I said, there'll be a recording of the webinar along with the presentation, which we'll post online. There's always a lag of a few days, so please bear with us. But those will be available um, online and you'll be able to access them through the website. Um, you'll notice that this is the second, I think, joint webinar that we've done between um, IEA Mexico and Brazil. And uh, we think that it's, it's really exciting to, to be able to kind of combine different countries in the region to talk about some of the dynamics that we see in Latin America and in Brazil and Mexico, and, and we plan to continue this. So, so again, thank you for all of the support. Um, and the, we'll also post the, translation, the translated versions of the, the PowerPoint presentations up on the web. And just as a last reminder, we'll be sending around um, a survey, so please look out for that in your inboxes. And we, we really do look forward to, to your comments and suggestions. So thank you again to Joe, and thanks again for, for all the support, and have a great day.